as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. souls with joy. When His loving arms receive us, and His songs our tongues employ, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth Straight at his feet. Kings of kings and heaven will crown him when our journey is complete. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth. Wow, half of September is about done. Still got a lot of things to happen here as we go through the rest of the month of September. This is the last week of summer, and uh, this summer is, I'm not going to regret saying goodbye to summer. We get to, to Saturday, I think it is. September 17th, tonight we're going to have a business meeting following the evening service, so keep that in mind. And then uh, Monday, starting Monday evening, the GIBM going to have a fellowship meeting at uh, uh, St. Joe, and uh, any details about it, please see me. Uh, there's a card in the back. You can check the QR code. Get uh, Well, let me just real quickly give you the Monday night. The service starts at 7, Tuesday morning at 8.45, and Tuesday evening at 7. And... Uh, Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. So keep those in mind. If you're interested in details, please see me. I can give you directions, or you can come along with me if you're interested. Uh, give you more details, but see me tonight uh, about that. And then uh, next week, next Thursday, the 21st, we have the Ladies' Bible Study. Uh, and then we're going to have... Um, Let's see, the following Thursday we'll have outreach, the men's meat feast, and the Saturday outreach, that uh, men's meat feast on the se September 29th. I need to know a count of those who are interested in going to that. Cost is $10. You need to see me tonight, all right? So please uh, uh, get with me on that. And then um, with that said, why don't we go ahead and have the ushers come. We'll take up the offering tonight. Let's pray. Lord, I come before you tonight. And Lord, as we open your word and we hear from you, Lord, I ask that you would touch our hearts and change us, that we would be like putty in your hands, that we would be malleable, that would affect us, or that we would not apathetically sit here and hear from you. Lord, I ask that you bless this offering and bless the message tonight. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's take our hymn book again, turn to 623. Hold the fort, 623. Oh, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now Um, with that song, does anybody here know where the wave the answer back to heaven, waving your Bible in the air, where that might have come from? Some, some do. Miss Erica says she does. I'm pretty sure you do too, right, Pastor? The wave the answer. Have you ever heard where that originated from? Brother Ryan, what, what do you think? Brother Art, Art Wilson is the one. Um, and you can't read the history of the Baptist, Independent Baptist in Kansas without reading about Brother Art Wilson. Um, he's a great man of God, started several churches and had a heart really for the small country churches that are scattered throughout all of Kansas. Um, in fact, I never met Art Wilson, but I've listened to some of his sermons on, uh, even on a cassette. That's a, yeah, what's that? Oh my goodness. I, I, I'm old enough to remember we would stick pencils in the cassettes and wind them. Brother Tim knows what I'm talking about there, amen? Amen. Um, but uh, I, I was actually, um, we had just gotten to Heartland, I think, right after Brother Art Wilson passed away. I remember uh, some things being said and done around that time. But anyway, from what I've understood and what I've always been told is he was the one it originated with the wave the answer back to heaven. I think that's an appropriate, appropriate thing for that song for sure. All right, well enough of that geeky history lesson. Let's get into Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, if you find it there, stand with me. And I want to say this tonight because uh, if you've been with us in the study, you know where we're at. Uh, we're going to start talking about um, the dynamics of the household. And so let me encourage you right up front. You say, Brother Travis, I am not married or I am widowed or widower. And uh, how can this apply to me? And I think that there's something here for everybody. 
And so don't, don't tune out if you're not, if you say, I don't have a spouse or my spouse isn't with me anymore. Um, there's certainly lots to be gleaned here because ultimately the overarching theme is that the household would be filled with the Spirit. And ultimately, what we're going to find, I think, if I do my job well, is that the way we're filled with the Spirit at home will determine how we're filled with the Spirit at the church. It's a true thing. So we're going to look at that this uh, evening. So let's, let's pick up right where we... Well, let's do this. Let's jump back to verse 18 and kind of get a run and start. Because this has a really... This is a cool little thing. Verse 21 is almost like a hinge... Uh, linking what was said to what is about to be said and really could kind of go with both the previous text and the text that we're getting into tonight. And uh, so we're, let's just jump back to verse 18 and kind of get a running start at it. He said this, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water, or excuse me, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now the, the text continues as we get into the section about children and then ultimately um, in the servant-master relationship that was present very much in the household uh, in this day. We'll talk about those two relationships I think next week. Uh, we've got our plate full. Hopefully we can get through all this tonight just with the husband and the wife. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer this evening and ask Him to be with us. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You today just for the many blessings that You've given us. Lord, you are so good to us, far more than we could ever imagine and understand. And Lord, the, this evening as we open your word and uh, we endeavor to draw from it what you've already said, I pray you help us to just have hearts of understanding, that we would uh, be attuned to your spirit tonight to let the spirit reveal your truth to us. Lord, help me to preach in a way that would make things clear and to not be a stumbling block. Lord, help me to preach tonight. Father, I pray that you'd be with each one that's here, that uh, Lord, you'd use the Bible in a special way in their lives tonight that it would mold us, it would shape us, it would change what we think and how we act. That when we leave this place tonight, that we'd be different than we came. That we'd be closer to the image of your Son. Lord, we can do nothing without you. Endeavoring to attack spiritual issues is a fruitless thing without your help. And I pray you help us do just that tonight. Lord, just be with us as we open your scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Marriage, I could have just started out like this, marriage, yes, a little princess bride action there, is what brings us together today. No, um, marriage is, is a staple in the Christian faith. 
It is something that is not a light matter. In a day and an age where we uh, hear people say it's just a piece of paper, that the importance of the marriage relationship is being ever diminished, and yet God says, hey, it's still an important God-ordained institution. Now that's an important thing to know. That God ordained it. He made it. Therefore, he can decide who can and can't be married. Now, I was grow- when I was growing up, there was an old Nickelodeon show, and one of the characters on that show uh, used to say all the time that he loved orange soda. And his friend would say, well, why don't you marry it? And so he married his orange soda. This is a goofy little gag, right? And we understand, we, well, we did, we understood at the time that this was all facetious and it was all for a laugh and it was absolutely illogical to marry a two liter of soda, right? But today we seem to stumble over some of this stuff, don't we? We don't find the humor, but we find facts where there should be probably humor, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. There was a day and an age, and I'm just going to throw this out here to you this evening. There was a day and an age when it was probably comical for in the setting of a youth rally or some youth event for a man to comically dress up like a woman. And, you know, there may be an age has gone by. Not today. Not today. And I, can I be honest with you? We've had in, not any time super recent, but within the last four or five years, we've had some churches that have attempted that kind of humor to no success. This led to some real conversations about why that's probably not the best idea. uh, As we've been out and traveled with the youth department and different things. Because here's what's happened is God has created this beautiful picture and he's given us this gift of marriage. And man has taken this blessing of God and has perverted it, and has changed it, and has said that love is love, and you, who are you to say who can love each other? If I want to marry my Fido, then I'm going to marry my Fido. Weirdo. That's what that is. And yet, as we look at what God has done in instituting marriage, we understand this, that In the realm of our Christian walk, because that's what we're talking about in Ephesians, isn't it? That we are to have our walk talk louder than our talk talks. And that we're to live by what what the Bible says. And it's supposed to permeate in all that we do and and in life and how we walk in life and how we live our lives. And what we say and what we do ultimately is impacted by the truths of Christianity. And so with that, we see that marriage has a big, uh, a big factor in our ability to serve God. It does. It certainly does. Well, you say, Brother Travis, how can you say that? Well, let me just tell you this. Uh, my profession, marriage can either qualify me or completely disqualify me as a preacher. What does that mean? It's interesting. We had, uh, you know, we had a president who was on his, I think, third wife. Right? The, the, in the previous administration. And yet that was not a sticking point for his position in the highest, the highest position of the land. And we see uh, failed marriages that take place all across uh, major industries and CEOs of companies. And it has very little bearing on it. But in the ministry, in the ministry, a failed marriage, both that would end in divorce and one that is not healthy disqualifies the pastor. Absolutely. Now tonight, I want to just throw this out here. <clears throat> and I want to tread lightly here because I, I'm a cognizant of the crowd and all that. But, you know, the, the issue of divorce and remarriage is, is a touchy subject. And tonight, I don't want to be mistaken that I am not saying that having been through a divorce or having a broken marriage disqualifies you from serving God at all. Not the case. Okay? So let's clarify that right up front. But let's try this. Those that can, let's give attention to our marriages in such a way that we could honor God with our marriages wherever we're at in our walk. Okay? But I, wanna, I want you to understand that in, as we get into this and we start to see the roles of husband and wife, we have to understand the gravity of the marriage picture. 
It's a big one. It's a big deal. Can I tell you this? You say, Brother Travis, yeah, sure. Pastors being married or, or having uh, problems in their marriage, that, that disqualifies them. And, and let me just point this out, that there is no in-between there. Did you know that? That there's no like, oh, if you're in the middle ground as a pastor, you are okay. It's literally pass or fail. It's either you're disqualified by your marriage or you are qualified to pastor or be a missionary by your marriage. And so this idea, especially for us in the ministry, and even more so, can I say this, for the members in the church, your marriage should be at the utmost forefront of the importance of your life. It ought to be something, look at me, that we give the most intentional attention to, both as those that are currently married or maybe those that are looking forward to marriage. It ought to be very important. Well, why is that? Well, because our text tells us this. That Christ likens the marriage of a man and a woman to that of Christ in the church. That picture of Christ in the church is never to be broken. It's not God's intention. It's not to be separated. It's not that they would be in animosity or at odds with each other. It is this picture of a loving father, a, a loving head that is uh, taking care of and doing what is in the best interest of the bride and the bride lovingly submitting to the head is the picture. And so we have here this idea of marriage. And yet this is all amidst, or all against the backdrop of this idea of being filled with the Spirit. And yet to be filled with the Spirit and to have the life that is Spirit filled, and don't forget, don't get lost in this, that we talked last week about how Paul is making this comparison to what it is like to be outside of the faith and what it is like to be controlled by the Spirit in the faith. And there's a set of cons comparisons that are made there. In fact, even in the previous chapter, as he talks about walking not as other Gentiles walk, walk as people who've been bought by the blood and being, being Christians and all of that, we understand this, that in the backdrop of what is taking place here, he is showing us that we are to be filled with the Spirit, and it is by that filling of the Spirit that we have the ability to submit to one another. And so we get to verse 22, where he says this, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now let's stop and consider. This is not a text that you're probably going to hear preached in very many pulpits. Some people, maybe it's my naivety, Pastor, I don't know. But some, I think some people are afraid to, to, to step on this word of, of submission. To some ladies, submission is a dirty word. Right? Can I just put it this way? As Americans, as, as Americans, our heritage is not to submit. It's just who we are. That's the way, that's the way that our culture has, has brought us to, to think is that from the very beginning in 1776, our, our thing was we're not going to submit to the rule of the tyranny of England. And so, you know, I like to post on, fa on Facebook for the 4th of July a picture. Well, I'll have to figure something else out because... The queen is no longer with us, but a picture of, I used to, it was a picture of Queen Elizabeth, and she was all looking angry, and I, it said, Happy Treasons Day on July 4th, right? Because we, you know, we revolted, and it is in us. It's to say, you know what, when there is injustice, when there is this, the, at, at our core, who we are, are, we have rebelled against for the greater good, and it is something I think that is in our culture as Americans. And I think it bleeds over into, into our thinking as Christians. It can we're not careful. And so this idea of submission, both as a wife, but really the backdrop saying submitting yourselves one to the no another in the fear of God, it really has something, uh, an element of counterculture that is something that might be foreign to some. Absolutely. But yet he narrows it down here and saying that wives are to submit to their own husbands. Well, what's that mean, Brother Travis? Well, that means this. Miss Judy? I am not your husband, but I am a husband, but I'm not your husband. Yeah, that means Miss Judy does not submit to the authority of Brother Travis. No, Miss Judy submits to the authority of Brother Steve. No, not Brother Stephen. Pastor. Well, let me just put it this way, just because pastor is a pretty broad title for a lot of people, right? 
Uh, she says, submit to Larry Scuffum. That's who it is. Hey, hey listen, Miss Erica, your own husband is, well, that's me. I like that. And Miss Gina is downstairs, I assume, in the nursery, is to submit to Stephen. Now, understand this. Submission, let me define it this way for you. Um, Webster's defines submission in this way. To surrender, to yield one's person to the power of another, to give up resistance, submission. That's what, he, that's what, it, that's what it defines it as. To surrender, to yield one's person to the power of another, to give up resistance. Now, here's the thing. Giving ourselves over to authority, the word authority doesn't, isn't synonymous with tyranny. Okay? Now, I want to say this to you. And this is important because when we think about submission to authority, the reason I think it, it, it causes some to kind of grate against it is because in submitting to an authority, to a head, there's potential for abuse, right? And so let me just clear this off right here and hopefully clear it up. This idea of wives submitting to husbands is not because the husband is the king of the castle. And the woman, when I get home, there better be a sandwich on the table and there better be, you better massage my feet as I kick my shoes up and do nothing around that. that that's not the idea of submission, Right? That's not the, the, the drive behind this text. In fact, we're going to get here in just a moment, but there is just a couple verses that are devoted to the wife. I think it's three verses here devoted to the wife. And then there are four verses devoted to the children. And the largest section in this household order is really devoted to the man, to the husband. And so the responsibility there is much, uh, much greater, and he's been held to a, a higher standard, really. And we're going to see that in just a moment. Now, does submitting yourself to your husband make you less than? Well, I'm glad you asked that. It's a good question. And I'm going to say no. How many of you have ever heard the, the, this Hebrew, these Hebrew words? Azar Konegdo. <laughs> Miss Erica raised her hand. She, I asked her if she'd heard it in the van, when we were driving to church tonight. These are the words in Genesis chapter 2 that are translated help meet. I'm going to tell you about Azar Konegdo. It's only used in two other contexts in all of the Old Testament. Three times it's used of a military force that is coming along to aid Israel. Sixteen times Azar is used of God in his help to Israel. Now hold on. That's significant. That means the, the very first words that God used to describe woman in the creation story, in Genesis, as he's laying it out, knowing all that God knows, let's not forget that, he understood all that was going to happen in the garden. He understood all that was going to happen in the future. He understood everything about you and who you are, and yet, as woman, he described you as Azar Konegdo. It has an element of a warrior that helps. That's kind of a cool. I thought that was neat. But more significantly, 16 times he uses it in his, in, in the context, in primary, this is the primary use. He uses it twice about woman in Genesis, three times about other militaries, 16 times about himself and how he aids Israel. Now, would you say that God is subservient to Israel? Anybody? Absolutely not. God is not subservient to Israel. And yet he says that woman who I'm going to create because it is not good for man to be alone. He is she is going to be this help me, this Azar Konegdo who's going to come alongside him, who's going to help him with something that he cannot help himself with. Amen. That's who my wife is to me. She is a peace and a support that I could not support myself with. That's it. And so when God created woman, he gave her a very specific role. And so this whole, if we were to put this into theological terms, everything has a theological term. It's some, of it, some of it is mind-numbing, because we've got to understand this. Theology is not necessarily Scripture. It ought to be based on Scripture, but theology is just simply man's attempt to try to understand God. So when we're talking about theology, always take it with a grain of salt. 
and make sure that it lines up with the Bible, with what the Bible says. Because in this issue about Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 and Genesis chapter 2, there's really a spectrum that is used. And it is, on one side, it is this idea of complementarians. And this is really what, where I fall and where I think the Bible falls, is that God created man and woman with distinctly unique roles that are different. And the authority is given differently. But the dignity and the respect for which that person represents is the same. Because here, watch me now. That woman is created in the image of God. She is an image bearer of God. And thus, that in and of itself gives her dignity and respect. Absolutely. But yet, the role and the function by which she is to execute that is to be complementary to the role of the man. So on the one side of the spectrum, you have this idea of complementarianism. And on the other side, there is this idea that is known as egalitarianism. How many have ever heard that term? To be an egalitarian. And this side is the complete opposite of the complementarian. It would say, women and men are no different. In fact, some of the people that I rub elbows with, uh, I, don't, I've, I hesitate to call them friends, but maybe acquaintances, acquaintances would be uh, the better term there. They would take this position and they would say things like, God is not man or woman. And they would say that anything that man can do, woman can do. And that's the egalitarian. So would they say, all right, women can be pastors and women uh, can be the head of the house and the man can, you know, do whatever. They're equal in all things. And yet I don't think that that's the case. If we read the scriptures, remember, that's the theological terms. If we read the scriptures and we see how God has laid these roles out, I think that they might have a problem with Ephesians chapter 5. I think they may have a problem with reading through this text. And so we see this in the very first uh, verse here, that wives are to submit themselves to their own husbands. That this idea of submission, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden as God was laying out the roles that these, uh, the husband and the wife would play in the marriage. And yet, all, throughout all the plan of God's plan for marriage, this was it. that The woman would submit to her own husband. But he adds this little tag at the end of verse 23 or 22. It really changes the tone of the verse. He says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That changes it a little bit, doesn't it? As unto the Lord. Well, hold on, Brother Travis. I'll submit myself to the Lord for sure because he is never wrong. But my husband, he is often wrong. <laughs> Some of you are saying amen. Some of you are saying oh me. Right, but that doesn't change what the verse says. It says, as unto the Lord. Now, as we look at these roles, I want to, I want to be very clear. Um, man, I cannot remember. We were down at Branson for the marriage retreat, and um, Pastor, maybe you can help me. There was a guy that preached, and uh, he was talking about the marriage relationship. I, I'm, this is going to sound so critical of me, and it was, and God smote my heart for it. He got up. And I never heard of him before, but he looked like a teacher who taught paleontology. Can you remember what his name was? Do you, he, wasn't very, he was a much older guy. He was really tall, white hair. I, his name is escaping me. But I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I just had in my mind how he was. And man, I'm going to tell you what. Amazing. Amazing. And one of the things he said about it as he approached even this text is he said, these, are, these, these words are not here for the man, for the husband to take the Bible and look into his wife and say, hey, sweetie, go, go do this as unto the Lord. Or, hey, uh, for the wife to look at the husband and say, hey, uh, you're not loving me as Christ loved the church. He said this, to stay in your lane. That this part of the text is written to wives and the husbands have their part of the text. And so this is not, listen to me, this is not to be used as ammunition. This is not to be weaponized to use to try to bring your wife into submission. That's not the way that this submission works. This submission is supposed to spring from a life that is filled with the Spirit. Amen. Right. And so he says that, that they are to submit to their own husbands as unto the Lord. Well, why is that, Brother Travis? Look at verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife... 
even as Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. So here we see this, as He begins to unpack why this is the case. We see these complementary but different roles. That the wife's role is different than the man's role. The man, going all the way back to Genesis, chapter 2 and 3, it was placed as the head. And it is this picture of Christ as the head of the church. We've seen this theme come through uh, different parts of Ephesians already, as it showed us how Christ is the head of the church. Meaning this, that His authority is there. Did you know that pastor is not the head of our church? Absolutely not. He's the under-shepherd. We have a head, and His name is Jesus Christ. He's the head of this church. He's the one calling the shots. And he, uh, Paul here, through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, likens the man's role in the marriage to that of Christ as the head of the church. And as that, as we look at how Christ in His headship of the church is, we find this, that He is the Savior of the body, isn't He? He died for the body. He died for His church. He cares for His church. He loves His church. And He's saying this, that the husband as the head is to function in that same capacity to, to the wife. Verse 24 reiterates what He's already said. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. In everything. I want you to hang on to that because we're going to talk about that in just a moment. In everything. There to be subject. And he turns his attention to the husbands. Everybody doing all right? I don't know if we're going to make it all the way through this tonight. He says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, some will, some will read that text and they might be tempted to say this. I'm willing to die for my wife. But man, let me ask you this. Is all that Christ did for the church, is that all he did was die? Well, hold on. It's not even proper to say that in the past tense, is it? That all he did, because it's all that he is doing. In fact, man, it's almost like Paul spent three chapters talking about all that Christ was doing for the church. Did that happen? Absolutely. All that we talked about in chapters 1, 2, and 3, how that he made all of those uh, indicative statements, these declarations of truth, of all that we have access to and all that Christ is doing, being uh, this supreme authority who has set at the right hand of God the Father, and he is working on the behalf of the church. Well, why, why do you say that? Because when we preached through that, didn't you say that that was like for the individual believer? Well, yeah, but remember this. This is all in the backdrop of the church, and the people make the church, don't they? You've heard me say this uh, numerous times. We do not gather at the church, right? We gather what? As the church. Listen, the church is not these pews. The church is not this pulpit. The church is not pastor. The church is us as a congregation. A body of believers. Christ is doing great things for this body. And he says to husbands, to love your wives as Christ loved the church. In fact, it can almost be said this way, as Christ is loving the church. That's a tall order, man. We have a, listen to me, we have a deficiency of men who are loving their wives like Christ loved the church. Don't forget, this is against the backdrop of being filled with the Spirit. Can I just stop and say this? We have a deficiency of men who are willing to be filled with the Spirit. And if you can't, if you're not being filled with the Spirit, you're not loving your wife like Christ loved the church. Absolutely not. We talked about this this morning in Sunday school. We're looking through the book of Proverbs, and, and uh, we're in Proverbs chapter 2. Did you know that in you is, in your nature, there's a dichotomy? That's a big word. A dichotomy. There's a, there's a dual nature that we have. We have this old sinful nature that Paul referred to as the flesh. Anybody here fight with the flesh? Right. And then there's this other part of us that the Bible, that Paul calls this, the spiritual or the spirit, right? And the spirit and the flesh are opposed to one another, aren't they? Right. And so as we have mentioned even last week and pastor said last Sunday morning, the, the, our greatest enemy that we face looks at us every morning in the mirror. Amen. Right? 
I'm talking to you, men. You can't be filled with the Spirit if you're walking in the flesh. Do you know what the flesh does? Me first. Mm. You know what I'm so tired of? I'm tired of hearing about and reading stories about and seeing men who spend more time playing video games than engaging with their family. Come on, men. What are we doing? I look at Brother Jim down here. How many years were you and Miss Edna married before she went home? For those that didn't hear, 65 years, 17 days, and 24 hours. I'm surprised you didn't tell me how many seconds. I'm going to tell you what. You don't make it that far. You don't make it that far not engaging your family. In fact, I bet Brother Jim probably wouldn't agree with this, but I'm going to say this. You don't make it that far without loving like Christ loved. Without having some spirit-filled motivations, some spirit-filled actions. Because I don't know if you know this tonight, but men and women are different. Talk about a dichotomy that is uh, diametrically opposed. There are times where Miss Erica, I don't know, maybe this doesn't happen in your house. I don't know if you know this about my wife, but she can talk pretty fast. <laughs> Sometimes she'll, go, she'll get to talking to me and I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> and then she'll change subjects. I mean, it, it's literally, it feels, like, it feels like she's dragging me back and forth. I'm like, wait a minute, are we talking? Wait a minute, we got too many Ashleys in our life. Which Ashley are you talking about? It happens. It happens. We have men that aren't willing to be filled with the Spirit. Brother Travis, are you up here tonight telling me that you're the perfect example of being filled? No, 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 no. Absolutely not. But I'm going to tell you, there's some folks, there are some men, like I said, there are some guys, let's put it that way, that are more engaged in logging on and playing than they are about making sure that their family is raised right. Making sure that their wife has everything they need. Making sure, look, just simply being courteous to our wives. Men, we're... We're, dealing, we're, already, we're already playing with, the, with half a deck. God made man and he looked down and he said, Ugh, something's missing. I mean, literally, that's what he said. Ew, it's not good for him to be alone. <laughs> Maybe that's not the tone he used, but that's how I read it. <laughs> I, I, I promise you that's what he said when he looked at me. <laughs> we got to get him some help. <laughs> that's, what he, that's what he said. Listen to me, friends. Guys. That wife that God gave you, she's not a kickstand. We treat her that way sometimes. It's all about, sometimes we make it all about us. That's not loving, is it? Well, what, what do I have to do to make it my convenience? And then we use these excuses. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm alone up here this, morning, or this evening. But maybe it's just me that we get there and say, well, you know what? I, I go and I provide and I, I work a job. And, and, man, I do all these things for my family. And that's how I show my wife that I love her. Is that I'm working a job to provide for her. And, yeah, you ought to do that for sure. But that's nothing to get a pat on the back for. You need to love her. Aren't you glad that Christ doesn't just say, well, you know what, I provided salvation for the church. I'll just leave them alone, you know, when they have troubles and when they're going through the valleys of life, when they've had a hard day. Don't come talk to me because I've had a hard day. You don't even know what I've been through. I'm certainly glad that's not, how, that's not my Jesus. Amen. Hey. Come on, can you imagine that? Going through all that this life has, and Jesus said it this way. He said, to cast our burdens on Him. And yet, men, that is the standard by which we're being called to in our marriages. And I'm going to tell you tonight that I think that there's a deficiency, not just in the, in the world at large, but in our church even, of men who are willing to rise to this standard. To say, I'm going to love my wife like Christ loved the church. I'm going to rise to the standard of what Jesus did gave me for what, how he treats the church. That we treat her more as though she's some uh, opportunity to, to allow us more ease in life than when we treat her like a person. 
Husbands, we are to love our wives in the vein of being filled with the Spirit. Can I tell you this tonight? That ladies, you can't submit to your husband like as unto the Lord. And men, you cannot love your wife as Christ loved the church, void of the Spirit. Watch this. The most important time in your entire day is the time you open your Bible and you get alone with God. Amen. Listen, you're not going to find somebody who likes preaching more than I do. I love preaching. I listen to preaching. I've got YouTube playlists full of preaching. More than listening to preaching, I like preaching. I've yet once to ever fall asleep while I'm preaching. <laughs> Anyways, the fact is, you're not going to find a bigger fan of preaching. I think it's great. I think it's God-ordained. I think it's necessary. But you know what's more important than preaching? Is your time in the Scriptures. Your time reading and studying. How are we ever going to be Spirit-filled if the only times that we open our Bibles is on Sundays and Wednesdays? Our walk with God is either hindered or helped by what we do with our Bible when it's not church time. Think about that. Your personal time in the scriptures will directly affect your relationship with your spouse. When you get to a certain level of marriage, level 66 down here, when you get to that certain time, you can start to tell when your spouse has been walking with God and when your spouse is not walking with God. Married folks, you know. Maybe you're not as obvious about it as I am. Can I just be honest with you? When I'm not walking with God like I should, when I'm tired and when I'm hungry, I get snippy. That's the flesh. And men, I'm telling you, I think that there's some of us in here that are the same way. I think there's some ladies that they have problems submitting, and I think it may be that we need to check and say, hey, are we spending the time in the Word? Are we being fully submitted to the Spirit? So he tells husbands to love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Watch this. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy and without blemish. And so what we see here is that the intention of Christ and, and his love towards the church is that, it would be, that we would be sanctified or set apart, that we would be cleansed and we'd be holy, we'd be without spot and without blemish. See, God's plan in the church is that Christ would take the church and continue to mold and to shape and to direct us. And he likens that to the husband. Now, I said this to you a minute ago, that as the Bible said to the women in verse 24, let the, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. We have this mentality in our society, very much a cultural societal thing, that there's like this hierarchy in the house, right? That there are, uh, the man is the head of the house and he takes care of like taking out the trash and, and mowing the yard and the woman is uh, like responsible for cooking and cleaning. And when it comes to the kids, it's the woman's job. Well, hold on, men. We're going to see when we get here next week that it is the man who is given the admonition to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That verse in chapter 6, verse number 4, is addressed to fathers. Did you know this, men? That it is at our feet that the onus will lie about how our kids are raised and how they turn out. Let me say that a little bit more. Let me put the cookies on the bottom shelf. My friend, husbands, it is your responsibility to make sure your children are raised in such a way that they will serve God. 
This idea that we just say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to handle the big stuff. Uh, my wife is going to take care of the children and all that is involved there. I'm just going to leave it completely to her. I'll help her change a diaper here or there. I may help her wash a bottle or feed the baby. No, my friends, I'm here to tell you that you are, vi you are a vital, important part, men, of the raising and the, uh, ultimately the salvation of the soul of your child. Listen to me, I've got three daughters. You know what I want? I want them to see a man who's in love with God, who's not afraid to admit when he's wrong, who's willing to come to an altar and pray when God moves, a man who's moldable in the hands of the Spirit of God, a man who's going to show them what love is, like Jesus loved the church. I want them to see that in me. I want to make sure that the things that are being taught in Sunday school class are things that are according to the Bible. Some of, you might have, some of you might have known this. There have been times I've just walked down and sat in a Sunday school class, and I don't mean to make anybody nervous. Sometimes that has happened. I've sat in there and they're like, well, what's going on? Something wrong? No. I just want to see what's going on. I just want to know. Well, why is that, Brother Travis? Because they're, they're, they're harboring precious cargo. Those are my kids. Those are the kids that God blessed me with. And it's my responsibility to raise them in such a way that they're going to serve God. Because here's what we know, men. Are you listening? How they listen to me and how they submit to me will ultimately determine how they're going to submit to the Heavenly Father. Listen. Our role in the marriage is that role of headship. And it's not to make our lives easier. It's not what it was. He said that Christ was after sanctifying and setting apart and making better the church. Our job, husbands, is to make our wives better. To lead in such a way that would be to their benefit. Absolutely. Now, would anybody argue with me tonight that when God leads us, that it is... Not that it is ultimately to our benefit. Amen. Isn't that, the, is that a true statement? Man, that's the standard that God wants us to, to uphold. That's the, the mark that we're aiming at. Is that our leadership in the lives of our wives and ultimately our children would bring them to a place where they would be more holy, more righteous, more like Jesus. So the question is this. Is that how we're leading? Is that how we're stepping up to the plate? Now, wives are to submit to their husbands, even if he's not really worthy to be submitted to. The Bible says we're, you're still to submit to them. But on the flip side of that, men, are we making ourselves worthy of her submission? I don't know why this is. I've thought on this for a long time. In life, it seems like the closer we get to somebody, the more willing we are to be harsh with them. I don't know. I, I've thought about this in a, a lot of different ways, and I've said things like uh, being comfortable with somebody builds complacency. But can we just be honest tonight? There are things we'll say to our spouse that we would never dare say to anyone else. Now, I'm, not, I'm not just talking about like, Hey, look at this thing on my back. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> now, that's definitely a thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. But what I'm saying is like the words we use and the way that the tones that we'll take with our spouse when we're in a disagreement or the way we treat them, we wouldn't dare treat others that way. And I, it just baffles me. It's like the closer we get to somebody, the more we feel as though we could treat them in a, in a, in a certain way. And yet Christ says this, man, husbands, the way we love our wives ought to bring them to a place of greater holiness, Amen. greater righteousness, a closer walk with God. But Travis, I can't do that. You're getting it. I can't either. That's why Paul said it this way. You have to be filled with the Spirit. You have to be spirit filled. You have to have the spirit in control of our lives because it is only a fruit of the spirit working in the life of a husband that can bring about this holiness in the life of a wife. Oh man, 
clock is my enemy. So, man, let's, let's try to get through this. I think we can do it. So in verse 28, he says this. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And so this idea of not being selfish, but looking at her as that this idea he's introducing is the one fleshness. Right? And it's like, the, if we have a wound in our body, we would certainly nurture it and take care of it. Right? Not that the wife is wounded or in need of anything, but it's that we would do what is best for the body. And that would be the case with our wives. And he's saying this, that when we give that kind of attention to our wives, we're really helping ourselves. And he says this, for no man ever, in verse 29, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So there's that picture again. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And this is what he says, look at verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This one flesh. When Miss Erica and I got married, May 23rd of 2009, at that moment, my family became Miss Erica. Everybody else around me are relatives. This is a thing, isn't it? The in-laws get in the way of marriages. When, it, when you say, I do, at an altar, God has joined you together, and you guys have become one flesh. You're now your own family unit. And you all need to work together to ensure that nothing gets between that. Moms, dads, sisters, brothers, whoever, they're relatives to you now. Because when God has brought you together in the marriage covenant, you have now become one flesh. And as we say in marriages, what God hath put together, let no man tear asunder. Right? Because God is bringing this joining together of this one flesh. And we need to silence the noise of those around us. And we need to work on becoming that one flesh family unit. We need to cleave. A good way to remember that is that we leave and we cleave. And my friends, if you're here tonight and you have children, especially if you have children that are married, let them leave and cleave. Don't be a hindrance. I've said this, you've heard me. I'm praying already for the girls as husbands. That God would send them men to be married. Evelyn's already expressed to me that she likes cats. And I'm, 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 I may, I've entertained a thought that I never thought would be entertained. But you know what? We're not going to talk about that. I don't want her to grow up and be a cat lady. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that if anybody here is a cat lady. If you're catching my drift. I don't want her to be single. I want her to enjoy the blessings of marriage. But when the girls, if, they, if the Lord sees fit to send them a husband, which of the way I'm praying is, God, let them be just like me, and think just like I think, and agree with everything I say, and never disagree with me, which is not like me. <laughs> That's how I'm praying. God can do big things. But the fact is, and then also they, they got to live next door. They can't move away. They got to stay here. That's the other thing. I don't, want, I don't want, at least within 10 minutes. But the fact is, when they do, if God so, so, so sees fit to send them a, a husband, I don't want to get in the way. All joking aside, I don't want to get in the way. I want to be a blessing to them. I want them to first model what a, a godly marriage is to the best of our ability but then I also want them to have that same kind of godly marriage. I want them to see this one fleshness, and I don't want to be in the middle of that one fleshness. And I'm going to work very hard to not do that, and I'm going to work hard to keep Miss Erica from doing that. Right. And so uh, this idea of the one flesh, we're to come together and, and, and the marriage to, to build this relationship to become, that two shall become one. And then Paul says this, and, and this isn't about the one flesh relationship. This is really about this idea of the marriage picturing the church. He says, this is a great mystery. Now, we understand this. Paul wasn't married. 
Now, that's, there's a whole bit of nugget right there that we can talk about. Uh, uh, when we, there are some people that believe that in order to be in the ministry and to even pastor that you have to be married. I don't know that I agree wholly with that. I think there's some prudence in it, but I don't know that it's required. But yet Paul says this, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This is a great recipe. Love and respect. That men, we would give that love. And that women, you would give that reverence. In the backdrop of this, that we would be submitting to each other in the spirit by being spirit filled. So, we're out of time. I got some more to say. We might pick it up some next week as we run into chapter six. But everything we've talked about from submission to your husbands to love for your wife can only be truly accomplished through being controlled by the spirit. So really the question that should come from our text tonight is this. Are you fully being controlled by the Spirit? Are you in a spot where you say, hey, the love I have for my wife is without a doubt a fruit of the Spirit working in mine? Is a submission that I'm giving to my husband without a doubt a working of the Spirit? That ought to be the case. And in fact, I would submit to you tonight that it is the only way that that could be possible is by our submission to the Spirit, by being controlled by the Spirit. So, as we get into the invitation, we'll have the uh, musicians get into place. And we're going to have an invitation tonight. And the question is just simply this. Are you submitting like you should to your husbands? And husbands, are you loving your wives as Christ loved the church? If not tonight, it might just be that you are not being controlled or filled by the Spirit like you should. If that's the case, the altar is open for you to do just that. To ask God to, hey, help me, Lord. Help me to be more controlled by your Spirit. Help me to allow the Spirit to have more of me and less of the flesh. I'm going to pray. As soon as I'm done praying, uh, we're going to get this uh, invitation started. And I, I, I implore you to move. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you tonight just for your, the time we could spend in the Word. Lord, help us to be Spirit-filled people. That our walk and how we act and the way in which we live our lives would be primarily dictated by your Spirit. And more specifically tonight, that our marriages and how we interact with each other and how we respond and how we love one another in our marriages would be a fruit of and be dictated by your spirit. Lord, I pray tonight that you bless this invitation. I have no idea of the things that you have for these individuals that are here tonight. Lord, I I just ask that you would let the spirit work in his way, that you would convict and convince as, as you see fit, Lord, and that if you're moving tonight, that folks would respond. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all you've done for us. Just bless this invitation now in Jesus' name. Amen.